this evening. I hope you enjoy it, but before we really get into that, I'd like to uh, let you know uh, about some other things that we are having in the next month. May 15th, 16th, and 17th, we are having three days of history. Um, Mr. Robert Sampson will present cinders, railroad tracks, and uh, receipts for pillowcases, a, a selection of items linking Mind Falls Gatehouse with the Nashua Manufacturing Company that will be exhibited. Um, and on May 16th, we have the Abbott Spalding House Tours, which is the house next door, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Sunday, May 17th, area, an area walking tour with Catherine Pullman in her AP History class, uh, the call for society, uh, call the Society for Times. Also on May 16th, we have the National Garden Club annual plant sale that will take place on our property over here. And the same day, uh, May 16th, at 11 a.m., we will have our, it seems, annual uh, Triangle Manhole Cover Auction. Uh, the auction is the Nashua Foundry Triangular Manhole Covers will be held to benefit the Nashua Historical Society. And the gatehouse. Oh, be. yes, and the children from the gatehouse. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Student Historic Preservation Team. We'll have the gatehouse open from noon to 3. That's on Saturday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's a busy week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, Thank you. Uh, what's the dates again on that? 15th. Yeah. Oh, okay. May Those 15th, three days. May 16th, and May 17th. Can you be able to get into the gatehouse? Yes. Mm -hmm. That will be the gatehouse is noon to 3. Uh huh. The manhole cover auction will be at 11 a.m. here. And the uh, Spalding House tours will be on Saturday, 10 a.m. to 1. Okay. Do you have to come here first to go to the tour? No. 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 Um, some of the events that weekend are still in the process of being firmed up, formalized. Uh -huh. So you might double check here first with a phone call. But um, right now, the tentative plan is to, people can go right to the gatehouse anytime between noon and 3. Okay. It'll be opened up, and you can see the restoration work that's been going on. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, she wants to wear the gatehouse. If you drive to Stello Stadium, mm -hmm. is everybody familiar where that is? Uh, it's behind the Public Works Garage over near Nashua High South on Riverside Drive. Um, if you park at Stella Stadium, there's a dirt road if you uh, walk to the river on the right-hand side of the stadium. And from there, you'll be able to see the gatehouse and that entrance to Mine Falls Park. There'll be plenty of people around. Just ask any one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Susan Feynman. Mm -hmm. uh, she's here to speak about... Uh, the Nashua District 1 Schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. That is the one in South Nashua, in that, uh, the cemetery by uh, the Royal Ridge. Susan? Thank you. I'm so gratified. It's such a really nice turnout. Uh, thank you very much. I hope it's the subject. <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Susan Feynman. I was a teacher in the city of Lowell. Uh, for 31 years. I retired in 2002 and we, we were offered an early retirement and I grabbed it. <laughs> and I was looking uh, in the paper one day and there was an ad for a school marm. This is after I retired and I thought, what would they ever need a school marm for? <laughs> so my friend encouraged me to respond to this ad and it turns out that 
And I had no idea that we have this beautiful one-room schoolhouse down there on the, the Daniel Webster Highway, right next to CVS and Walgreens. But I had passed that schoolhouse at least 4,972 times and thought it was part of the cemetery. And I've always had a, an interest in schoolhouses, never ever thinking that I would be hired for this job as a school marm to put on a historical presentation for the fourth graders of the city of Nashua. And the schoolhouse is uh, curated by a group of wonderful ladies in the city known as the Benevolent Association of the Daughters of the King. And I don't know if you're uh, um, familiar with that association. It's a very quiet, uh, charitable organization that does very nice things for the children of Nashua. Very quietly, they have an endowment and they spend the interest on doing charitable works for children of Nashua. And one of their projects turned out to be, in 1976, the restoration of the uh, District Number 1 schoolhouse on the Daniel Webster Highway. So that's why today we have this beautiful restored schoolhouse and it's been op this program has been operating now for 30 years. And I'm so proud of the city of Nashville because they are so far and above and ahead of so many cities and towns and townships across the country who are just starting to restore their schools. Only in the last 30 years have they found the value in their one-room schoolhouses. Nashua was way, way ahead of the curve. And I am now involved in a national organization called the Country School Association of America that is dedicated to the preservation of one-room schools. And I, I've been all over the country now visiting one-room schoolhouses, and they are magnificent. And ours is ours, and I say ours, is no less magnificent than the schoolhouses that they're restoring all over the country. So what I'd like to do is show you what we're doing nationwide to restore schoolhouses, and then I'll take us uh, on a little pictorial tour of the Nashua schoolhouse, the district number one schoolhouse. And it's all good news today. It's all good news for preservation. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to be talking with my back to some people, but I have a good, loud teacher voice <laughs> honed over many, many years, and you will not be asking me to speak up, I trust, trust me. So uh, we probably just need the lights to go down a little bit. And This is called the past and future for the one-room schoolhouse. And I opened this um, presentation with um, the picture of uh, a little schoolhouse that was dedicated last August up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, known as the Indian Stream Schoolhouse. But when yeah. I when I talk to people around when I talk to people around the country, there's usually a very good reason why they're in the crowd. And some people have a taught a taught in a schoolhouse, or written a book about schoolhouses, or the historic society members. And there's something enjoyable about the aura of a one-room schoolhouse. This is a picture I found in a Nashua book of the one-room schoolhouse taken in the late 1890s, I understand. And this is exactly what we picture as the idyllic setting for a one-room schoolhouse. That dirt road is the Daniel Webster Highway. And the field with the um, stone wall is now the parking lot of Walgreens. Unfortunately, because it is such a beautiful picture, and when I look at that, I, I think, oh, what a time. Well, this is our schoolhouse today, and I'm, most of you are familiar with the schoolhouse. Built in, a, built in 1841, it's been standing solidly for 168 years now. The, the district number one people, the people that lived in the district, spent $629 to build the schoolhouse, and I think that they got a really good deal for their money. <laughs> and at the time, it was fortunes. And from what I'm reading, and I keep looking for old records, and what I've found is that uh, Mr. Little, who ran the place next door called Little's Tavern, or Little's Station, donated to, or loaned the district $200 to get the project started. Because it was either, they were either going to replace or repair the existing wooden schoolhouse. So this is what we have today. It is a beautiful, beautiful uh, classic brick schoolhouse with windows all around. And I would love to set a date if anyone would like to come and visit our schoolhouse, ours meaning all of us, because it is technically owned by the city of Nashua, and it's kept up by the Cemetery Commission 
of the city. So there are your tax dollars hard at work. They come every Thursday and they clean the yard and they cut the grass and they really keep this cemetery up. It's the oldest cemetery in the city. And the oldest stone, some of you may be um, familiar with the oldest stone, dates back to 1687 and it's the um, stone of an Elizabeth Weld who I understand is an ancestor of the former governor of Massachusetts, William Weld. Well, this is just our logo for the Country School Association. Well, I've done a lot of reading about one-room schoolhouses, and you should hear the names they call them when you, are read, you know, when you find little passages about them. And these are just a few that I've listed, citadels of learning, depositories of liberty. They sound like these monumental universities today. But believe it or not, they had more picturesque names. <laughs> <laughs> the disappoint, disappointment creep. Aren't those cute? And these are actual names of schools, and I picked out some of the some of the more picturesque names, and like the and, and they all have a history to them, like the Last Chance School. Are they all New Hampshire? No, they're not. They're all over the United States. Uh, a lot of New Hampshire schools were numbered, like the ones in Nashua were numbered number one through number 11, and they just called them the district number one school or the district, district number two. They did start naming them later, though. The last chance school was named because they fought for six months over what they were going to call the schoolhouse, and finally the, they put down the gavel and the chairman says, this is your last chance to name that school. <laughs> and so that's the name it got. Where was the eight square schoolhouse? The eight square schoolhouse, there, there were a number of them, actually. Oh, because there was one in New York State. Yeah, there's, there are a number of them, actually. And I've been in contact with a lady with an eight square. That was, that was supposed to be the ideal configuration of a one-room schoolhouse, but it didn't catch on. They were generally named in honor of townships or people who paid money to build the school or famous Americans or people who donated the land. A lot of times out in the Midwest, the <coughs> farmer would donate a quarter of an acre for the schoolhouse, or even as much as an acre, and they would name the schoolhouse after him. So, And they usually talk about the little red schoolhouse. We always hear about the Little Red Schoolhouse, and orig originally they were painted red because it was the cheapest type of paint that they had. And they painted them red because it was always leftover red from the barns. They painted their barns red. It was an iron oxide paint. And from what I've read, after a while, when they invented lead paint and they started painting their houses white, people wanted their schoolhouses to look more like houses than barns, and then they started painting them white. So. Originally, they were actually unpainted. This is the uh, Putterham School that's down in Brookline, next to the Antique Car Museum. My mother went to that school. The Putterham School? Oh. Yes. And it's still open, and you can still go in there, and they've got it all restored. And uh, this is the one in Chelmsford Center, if any of you have ever been by. They have a beauty that's been restored. They used to use it for schoolhouse programs, but they've kind of let those go with uh, the MCAS problem. Uh, this is our neighbor, uh, Dunstable. That's their little historical society. That little schoolhouse was moved from Tingsboro. And around the country, you see the varying styles of the one-room schoolhouses, some with cupolas and some with bells. And our neighbor in Westford has a beautiful school known as the Parkerville School. It's an 1885 one-room that is meticulously restored inside, and I'll show you pictures inside. And then you go farther out west, and they have, isn't that a character? The styles are magnificent. Everywhere you go. That's unusual not having the windows on the side. The what, I'm sorry? The it's windows. It's unusual not having the windows right. because you need the light because there wasn't as much electricity. You're as absolutely some of these were right. And what they used to do, this schoolhouse was actually moved. This is in downtown, but it was actually moved from on another site, and it would have been sited so that the windows faced the morning sun. And they, had, they would have the two sides of windows, and they would try to face them uh, to get the morning sun and heat. So this one is kind of repositioned. But I agree with you. It's very, very strange to just have windows on uh, two sides. This little one you may have passed. It's on Route 62 down in um, Burlington, down in Burlington, Massachusetts. It's called the, um, the West School, and it dates to the late 1700s. 
And you can see, just I just put these in here to show you the varying styles. Our neighbors in Salem, New Hampshire, have the number five school. As you can see, it's numbered. And they also moved this schoolhouse. Many schoolhouses have been moved, and I'll show you pictures of them moving schoolhouses just to save them from destruction. Uh, people, uh, histor historical societies have moved them. This is probably the smallest school I was ever in. It was 16 to 18 feet square. But you couldn't believe how many kids they jam-packed into that one. But beautifully restored on the inside. This one is up in Kennebunk, Maine. And you've probably been to the center of Kennebunk. And you know what's attached to it? The jailhouse. <laughs> That's the jailhouse on the left. So the kids say, what, do you go from the jail to the school or the school to the jail? And these are friends of mine in League City, Texas. They have a little museum uh, for League City and the schoolhouse that they moved from Galveston, from the island of Galveston. And so this one was really moved far. And this little tiny one is in New Jersey. But it shows you that not only do they have red and white schools, but they also have yellow schools and gold schools and pale green schools. And, but look at the varying styles of these schools. And some of you have been up in York, Maine. And in the York Village there, there is a little schoolhouse that you can go. And that is very primitive, way back to the 1700s. Now, pink schoolhouses weren't painted pink originally. They were red. And very often the town fathers said, we don't want a red schoolhouse to look like a barn anymore. We want it white. And in one schoolhouse, they painted, they only had enough paint for one coat of paint over the red, and it went pink. <laughs> and so they decided to leave it pink because the people liked it pink. And there are a couple of pink schoolhouses in the United States that I know of. And this is a blue school, and this is down in um, Burlington County, New Jersey. They had a nine schoolhouse tour last fall, so I couldn't resist. And then you find even more elaborate schools in the Midwest, but they built according to what the, what the materials were in the area, what was available. And our brick schools, I understand, sometimes were built with the donated bricks from leftover mill buildings. So when they built those monumental mill buildings. It wouldn't be much to donate enough for a one-room school. And then, of course, if you go out, out west, in the southwest, you will find log schoolhouses, plank schoolhouses, because there's so little rain to damage them, they, they are um, preserved. In, in uh, around the turn of the century, it's estimated that there were about 219,000 schoolhouses in the United States of America. Um, and unfortunately today, you mostly find them in this kind of condition. Uh, just kind of sitting there by the side of the road, converted, rotting, uh, just sitting there quietly, often in a varying stages of repair that will never, ever make a comeback. And I understand that they used to sell the schoolhouses when they stopped using them to the farmers, who would then turn them into corn cribs and grain storage buildings. They'd add them onto their houses as garages. The local fire departments would burn them down for practice. Uh, they just, they weren't very revered as we do revere them today. And so this is basically, this was, a, this was an act, actually a, a Negro school. They called it a Negro school back in the 1900s. And that's what's left of it today. <clears throat> Except the interior has some beautiful beadboard that a friend of mine would like to save and restore the schoolhouse. Some of them have been turned into houses very nicely. This is the old Hutchins School, also up in Kenny Bunk, Maine. But didn't they do a good job on that one? And then out in the Midwest, this used to be a two-room high school in the middle of Iowa. And um, they turned that one into a house also. But this one is magnificent. They let us into this one, and it's, a, it's actually a one-room home that they've kind of made an open concept um, home out of the schoolhouse. But we'd rather see them preserved. And Burlington just did that and turned theirs into a uh, public museum. So if you're down in Burlington, Massachusetts, in the center, this beautiful schoolhouse sits right on the green. But there is one group of people in the United States of America that continues to build one-room schoolhouses, and that's the Amish. And the Amish have roughly, as I speak, probably 1,500 or more operating one-room schoolhouses in the United States of America. We're, from our number of 219,000, we're down to about 400 operating schoolhouses that are still used as public one-room schoolhouses. 
So the Amish continue to build them. They're very, very characteristic as you ride around Pennsylvania or Iowa or Illinois. There are plenty of Amish schoolhouses. You can tell them pretty much there's, there's usually a little shed where they park the horse next door. The yards are very simple for the children to play in. They come in varying styles. Yeah, there's the shed. They might have a swing set out the side, but they're very, very plain, and they continue to build them. Now, this one is a, an Amish school in Iowa, but it was purchased from the local, uh, one, the local school district and turned into an Amish school, but they do continue to build them as they need them. And this is another Amish school. But basically, for those that are still operating in this country as, as public one-room schoolhouses, the news is not good. They're closing them because of budget problems and um, small, like it says, small schools are fading from the countryside. And that's where the historic societies step in or the Benevolent Association of the Daughters of the King step in or someone who would like to make a donation to their town, they step in and try to save the school. Now, if you have a schoolhouse that has a history to it, you're more likely to get funding to save it. Now, this one, uh, you've probably been to the Wayside Inn in Sudbury. This little schoolhouse is open all summer with a docent in there, so you can go in and visit with them. And this one was actually moved from Sterling, Massachusetts by Henry Ford. And if you read the little brochures that you can buy in the gift shop, the story of Mary Had a Little Lamb is an absolutely true story, and it happened in this school building. And then the Herbert Hoover Historical Site, it's in Iowa, West Branch School. They said he attended this school for a short time, so it's well preserved. In New Jersey, in Bordentown, the Clara Barton School, she, t she opened this school, and it's still there for visitors to come in. Tiny little school, but beautifully preserved. Is it brick? Uh, it is brick, and it sits on the very corner of a little neighborhood, just, just the same place it was when Clara Barton started it. A tiny little wedge of land, and it's surrounded by beautiful little residential streets. And then the Rosenwald schools. Julius Rosenwald, is anyone familiar with Julius Rosenwald? <coughs> I wasn't either until I got into schoolhouses. Julius Rosenwald was the president and founder of Sears, Roebuck, and Company. <laughs> And Julius Rosenwald was a, a Jewish man who appreciated the struggle of the black people in the South, and he appreciated the business that the, that the black population brought to Sears and Roebuck. From his history, many black citizens were not allowed to shop in many of the southern stores, believe it or not. And so they did a lot of their shopping for major items through the Sears Roebuck catalog. The black people of the South made Mr. Rosenwald a very rich man. He wanted to give back to the people of the South, and he told the black communities, if you come up with half the money for building a school, I will fund the other half of those schools. And there are thousands, literally thousands of Rosenwald schools across the South, not which still exist, but there are still some they're trying to save. But Mr. Rosenwald, and I, and I used to know the number, and I apologize for not remembering the number, but it's more than 10,000 schools. Wow. That Mr. Rosenwald personally, with his fun, funds, financed to help, and he would not pay for the whole thing. He said, you come up with half of it, I will pay the second half of the money for you to build a one-room schoolhouse. And they all had the same design with this bank of windows on one side, and they were called Rosenwald Design Schools. Uh, the founder of IBM went to a one-room schoolhouse in New York. Nathan Hale. Where in New York was that? Uh, it did say, and I've forgotten there, it's in Post. oh uh, East Campbell, New York. And I don't know where East Campbell is. I haven't visited that one yet. But the Nathan Hale schoolhouses are in uh, two towns in, New in uh, Connecticut. Nathan Hale was only 21 years old when he regretted that he had but one life to give for his country. But he taught at least a term in each of these schools. It's important enough to the people of those towns that Nathan Hale taught there that they have preserved those schools as, um, as uh, historical uh, monuments and, and visiting places. So the birth of the Republican Party uh, is credited to Ripon, Wisconsin, in a one-room schoolhouse. And that sign will tell you how they held their first meeting there and called themselves the Republican Party. 
and this one in Woodstock, Connecticut, claims to be America's oldest schoolhouse that was in continuous use, in other words, in Connecticut. And then some very famous people went to one-room schoolhouses, and I have to read the list because I, uh, I, I've got a memory lapse here. Uh, William McKinley, Henry Ford went to a one-room schoolhouse, Calvin Coolidge, for those of you who recognize these famous people. Millard Fillmore, of course we probably wouldn't recognize Millard, but Laura Ingalls Wilder attended a one-room schoolhouse. Herbert Hoover, Warren Harding. Was there anything else? Of what? Was there anything else? Well, there were private schools, and many people did go to subscription schools where they actually paid tuition. They were, and, and most people, and you, you, you might even say that most people didn't attend schools when one-room schoolhouses were operating because only the children who could get away from farms basically yeah. went to the one-room school or weren't put to work in the mills. Mm -hmm. um, that was Warren Harding. Alan Shepard went to a one-room school in Derry, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And Martin Van Buren. Lyndon Baines Johnson went to a one-room schoolhouse. Mary McLeod Bethune, black leader for education. and. Charlton Heston went to one room schoolhouse. Moses went to a one story, one room schoolhouse. And unfortunately, today, very often, we have to move our schoolhouses or lose them. Our little schoolhouse in Nashua is so fortunate to be in the middle of the cemetery because it's not going anywhere. But they do move them, and they have lots of work ahead of them. These schoolhouses are usually stripped to the bone by the time they move them or start their renovations. This is a two-room schoolhouse that was moved recently, just last fall, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. But you can see the lengths to which people are going today to save the last of our schoolhouses. It's a two-room schoolhouse. They haven't decided what they're going to do with it yet. But I'm sure the Historical Society has a, a bid in for it. And this is what it looked before, and this is what it looked like after they moved it, or on the way of moving it. And they find a nice new place where a farmer might donate a little piece of land. They spend thousands of dollars on foundations and excavating, thousands. And they plant it on its new foundation, and the work hasn't even begun in, on the inside. But that's how much people appreciate the saving of their schoolhouses. And you can't even imagine what goes on when you want to move a schoolhouse. Because I'm in contact with people all over the country now who are moving them. And it can be a project that goes upwards of $200,000 by the time they finish. And that's a lot of fundraising. This is the one that is the $200,000 project. Looks like a shell, doesn't it? But someone fell in love with it and said, we're saving it. And they started to it. Pardon me? It was a little phrase. Do you know the age of it? I, it's, uh, it's, an 18, it's somewhere like 1860 to 1880. Mm -hmm. It's in Boone County, Indiana, and they should be dedicating it very soon. I will be heading to that when they do. It sits in the middle of a cornfield donated by a local farmer. They had to build to code, of course. They had to put in septic systems and bathrooms outside because if they're going to have visitors, they had to completely take off the roof and put on a new roof. But there is hope, as you can see, that they're making progress. And um, I'm going to be heading out there because I'm, this is a different one that's just being started to be renovated. But you can see the inside, what kind of work they have ahead of them. So you can see that we're way ahead here in Nashua, New Hampshire, with our beautiful schoolhouse. This little schoolhouse is in um, Pittsburgh, Indiana. It was moved. Uh, onto the site of a, an elementary school and they had to cross a major interstate <laughs> highway because they could not take it up over the overpasses to get it around. And so they had to get all kinds of special um, permits and help. And I understand this was moved during the days of CBs and the, the truckers were saying to the, C, to the trucks behind them, you are not going to believe what is crossing the road. <laughs> And sure enough, it did cross two. It's like crossing Route 93 twice, because the weight of the weight of the schoolhouse could not be taken over the overpass. But the good news is, here it is today, 1883 Pittsburgh uh, schoolhouse. It is magnificent. So there is hope. And what is the history we hope to save? Orville Taylor said, "If you found a school, you establish the liberty of your country." 
And if you want to take a high standing among nations, you better educate, educate your people. And if you want prosperity, this is the example of liberty. They built our schoolhouses for one reason, and that was to ensure national security. If you read about the history of the building of our schoolhouses, it was for national security, to create a unified and democratic nation that could fend off its enemies. And that, of course, was after the Revolutionary War, when they wanted to make sure that they had an edu educated and unified population, so that in those one-room schoolhouses, they could foster patriotism, the common English language, hello, where did we lose that, and literate voters. And I'm afraid that, that some of the votes that were cast in, in, in as many of our elections are not necessarily by informed people. But the public school was designed for that patriotism to unify the country, knowing that, uh, that immigrants had to be unified and could not continue to just hold on to their old heritage. This is a picture of the last, uh, the last class that ever attended the District Number One schoolhouse. And these children, it closed in 1921, and it was, uh, these children, these littler ones, were bused to a school closer to downtown, from what I read in the 1921 records. Uh, this boy here um, was the last graduate of the schoolhouse, and this, this teacher, Alice Smith, uh, this was her, she continued to teach, but she married a, a flooring contractor who had, who had six children. And they went on to have six more children, <laughs> so they had a dozen children. And the reason I know that is because I met up with her son in the cemetery one day. He was tending the grave of his aunt. And I said, oh, and he started telling me his mother taught, and I said, oh my God, I have your mother's picture in my schoolhouse. <laughs> so there she is, and he was very gratified that we were able to talk. So we tried to recreate those wonderful moments uh, that this schoolhouse was used before. And we do and we, we do try to we study, we look at old pictures, we try to see what was life, what was life like, and we look at these young teachers with these varied classes and varying in age from kindergarten all the way up to the eighth grade. They taught all eight grades in one room. Sometimes they were not even much older than the children themselves. They could be 17, 18, 19-year-old teachers who may teach a year or two years before they went off and got <coughs> married, and then you weren't teaching anymore. Uh, but you can see the various ages of these children, and some of them barefoot, some of them without shoes. So another one, young teacher. You can't tell whether it's the man teacher or the woman teacher in, the, in this group, but you can see the varying ages and the varying... Um, this was another, this was another uh, picture that was donated to the Nashua Historical Society. And this is a, one of the, uh, I don't know what year this was either, but it was donated by one of the little girls in that picture, or someone who was related to her. It was her, gran it was her granddaughter, apparently, that donated these pictures. And her name was Elizabeth Sargent. I don't know if anyone knows uh, who Elizabeth Sargent was, but uh, she is in that picture. I believe she's the blonde on the left. There were black schools as I told you uh, about the Rosenwald schools. And you can see the sizes of classes. There were Indian schools actually set up in the Southwest, one-room schoolhouses. There were, um, these are just, uh, we, we like to get interiors of old school shots so that we can find out what it actually looked like. It's very difficult to find interior shots. Most of them would take their entire class outside and they would pose in front of the school, as you'll see. But we like to find out about the life of these teachers, most of them being women at the time. And I will show you a pay scale chart. These schoolhouses were set in some of the strangest places. The most unusable land that was available usually went to the building of the schoolhouse. And they tried to, to center these schoolhouses so that they were, as, they were central to where the walkers would have to walk to them. And it wasn't always possible, and many, many fights grew out of where the schoolhouse was going to be placed. The sons were home doing the farming. And the sons were home doing the farming. And at best, the sons would come back in the winter time. They used yeah. to have school in the summer and in the winter in the 1800s because they, they scheduled the school classes around the farming season. <laughs> they didn't even open the schools in the spring and the fall because they were planting or harvesting. But when the big boys came back in the winter, they used to love to have men teachers come and teach them so that they could discipline them. Mm 
uh, strongly. The, this, the, the, that picture that you just saw was a picture of Nashua teachers that I took out of a Nashua book. I'll probably get in trouble for a copyright, but just to show the... Uh, and um, there, were, there were many men teachers, and many farmers actually took up teaching in the winter months as a part-time job to supplement the income from the farm. I'm surprised. My mother was a uh, one room, uh, schoolhouse teacher, mm -hmm. and we, men were not allowed to teach. Oh, wow. Because the women learned. took the jobs? The women could only well, teach. Well, when you see the pay scale, you'll understand why. <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah. you know, you know, women could only teach or be nurses. That's it. Yeah. When you see the pay scale, you'll find out that men were paid three times more. So these districts got a little savvy and decided, let's get three teachers for the price <coughs> of one. But you can this this was up in Farmington, New Hampshire. This is a, a picture that um, a gentleman over at the Hunt Home gave me, and he's the third boy in the on the left with the little bow tie, front row. He's a little Aww. devil, and he gave me these pictures. And his father is in this picture in front of the same school. <laughs> yes, 30 years before. And his father is the little boy in the front with no shoes on and the little white bow tie, fourth boy in. Oh, yeah. So we love to look at the old pictures just to see what, what could it possibly have been like for those people, for those teachers to have all grades all subjects, they say 40 to 50 different subjects a day had to be taught in 15 to 20 minute increments. While all the other children were sitting quietly, she would pull three or four children in a grade level up to the front of the room and do recitation with them. So here's the interior of our schoolhouse in Nashua, beautifully, beautifully restored. Yes, it is, and the stove is working, and I was in there this morning teaching two classes, and I had to light that stove at 8 o'clock this morning, and it was freezing in there. But I don't tell the kids I start with a Duraflame log, and then, and then when the kids come in, I put a real one in there. And I say, oh, we've got to feed the fire. So they're none the wiser, and you're not going to tell them, are you? So you can see the beautiful restoration jobs that have been done around this country. The, the problem being that the desks have been thrown out over the decades, just thrown out willy-nilly, and it's very, very difficult to get the original desks now. They're Are those worth electric lamps? Uh, they <coughs> might have had electricity. Some of these have been electrified over the years. Some of these are not uh, necessarily as old as ours. A lot of the Midwestern schools can date from the 1880s and early 1900s. And then they pick a year at which they're going to play too, uh, which they're going to restore too. But if you go out to the little schoolhouse in Sudbury, this is what you'll get, because it goes back to the 1700s. And ours can have the wooden seats because we're playing to 1841. Schoolhouse in Texas found all beautiful double desks. That would, this would sit two children to a desk. This is the Parkerville School in uh, Westford, beautifully uh, restored. The desks don't match, but they're very, very proud of having collected enough desks to fill a classroom. Our Salem, New Hampshire schoolhouse, beautifully done. Do you remember these desks? Yes. You have to, because I even had them. We had them at Lowell High School. Yes, we did. Yes, I did too. A class of 67, but I sat in those to the day I graduated. Yeah, and you did too. So, um, and then the recitation bench is a treasure today, the one that's in the front of the classroom. Uh, this one happens to be in Iowa, but those are a treasure. They're very difficult to find, but that's where the teacher used to teach the, the small groups. She'd call them up to the recitation desk, uh, bench. This is one of the most magnificent schools I've been in. It's so meticulously restored. It, everything is dated to 1913. The globes, the lamps, the maps, the calendar on the wall, every single item in there is 1913 because that's what they play to. They just take something historically significant in their town and they play up that, um, that era. So this is an old school in um, uh, New Jersey which has rebuilt their desks but have done a beautiful, beautiful job of restoration. Uh, Iowa Schoolhouse. With these kind of schools, sometimes you go in and you get stove envy because the stoves are beautiful and they are beautifully restored and many of them are operable. Uh, another one in Iowa. 
but you can see the trouble that people have gone through to dredge up these desks and dredge up these uh, stoves and haul these things in there and pipe them in. And you can see the ubiquitous pictures of Lincoln and Washington up there. And I was told that a lot of schools in the South don't display the picture of Lincoln, but I was told that's not true, so I don't know which story is correct. But the, all the schools up until at least before uh, Lincoln was president would put um, Washington's picture. And this is the schoolhouse in Sudbury also from the rear. Now this is the schoolhouse in York, Maine. And believe it or not, when you see those benches, that's exactly how it used to look in those old, old schoolhouses. Now this, some of us remember from the 50s, right? Yep. This is not a restored schoolhouse, but this is the interior of an Amish school. So you look like you're in a time warp. When you step back into these schools, you really feel as if you're in a time warp because they use the same equipment that came with the schoolhouse. And uh, they're very frugal people. They allowed us to take pictures after the children and after the teachers had left the building. They told us we were welcome to take pictures. And uh, we, we talked to the teachers. They were very young women. They are called to be teachers, and many of them have no higher than an eighth grade education. In fact, all of them, because that's all they educate their children, only to the eighth grade. But they have made a, a pact with the federal government, the pact being that in order to satisfy the guidelines of the 16-year-old threshold, they say that the, chi that the children can leave the eighth grade and go work in a trade. They can learn a trade from their parents. So they learn bu uh, buggy uh, repair, and they learn carpentry, and they learn bricklaying, so it satisfies the, the federal requirements. Okay, so living history, these are the kinds of programs we put on, including our district number one schoolhouse. We pick a grade, we invite them into the schoolhouse, we dress up as school marms, even though we're much older than the original school marms, and we create lessons. They write on slates. They write with dip ink pens. They work in copy books. They um, get up and do recitation. They do mental arithmetic. They even love to dress up. And we don't even care if they don't dress for the, the right date because they just have fun dressing up. I've had pilgrims show up. This is the end of the I've had pilgrims show up in my schoolhouse. And this is our schoolhouse here in Nashua from the back. So you can see that they're very diligently working on their slates. And we do try to recreate what it was like to get up and toe the line and do their recitation uh, just the way they did it in uh, the 1800s and early 1900s. And we have them do lessons on the board. They sit at the recitation bench. And they, they might do this for two hours or three hours, depending on the program in the schoolhouse. They do their poetry. They stand up and recite poetry or the New England States. They do their handwriting, their penmanship with a dip ink pen. As you can see, we've had a few accidents. <laughs> and that adds the beautiful patina to our desks. <laughs> and they diligently dress up like uh, the 1800s, 1885 in this case. The girls love to wear their hair in braids because they hear that the teacher pins the girls to the wall if they misbehave. <laughs> that she pins them. They, she pegs them to the wall by their braids if they misbehave. So this teacher clued these girls in to wear their hair in braids. They love to be disciplined. And the, the aspect of discipline in one of the schoolhouses is a whole nother topic. I mean, that's a whole nother presentation. It went from the creative to the cruel, believe it or not. And uh, I can remember even in the 50s, they still allowed uh, teachers to use corporal punishment which is uh, long gone by now, but I, I show this picture, the bottom one, to the, the children in the school, and they go, oh, doesn't the teacher get sued? And I say, so? <laughs> they not only got it from the teacher, but they got it when they got home, too. So um, when, oh, this is beautiful. When we, we had the national conference here in Nashua in 2007, and we had people from 24 different states come and visit, mm -hmm. and we took a tour of local schoolhouses, and this was the Parkerville school, and the lady at the Parkerville had the children all dressed up waiting on the porch as we came by. And the whole bus went, oh, look at how cute they look. And they did their lessons for us. And um, around the country, 
there are school marms all over the country. And there's Judy May, who's a, um, uh, one of our former school marms on the bottom. And the lady in black is called the traveling school marm, and she goes around the country to visit other schoolhouses and do lessons in their schoolhouse. And that's me up in the corner. And the schoolhouse ladies in Iowa who love to work with the children, and the lady in the one that went across the interstate highway. She's all dressed up. So to recreate the history, we like to know how they got to school, and you can see the distances that they walked. And you can see the roads down which they walked to school. Uh, basically, in the Midwest, it was usually not more than two miles. Huh, listen, like a kid would walk two miles to school today, right? But it was generally not more than two miles to walk to school in those days. And it could be a walk through the woods to get to your schoolhouse. And so we try to recreate it all, from the clothes to the teacher desks. This is a classic teacher desk to the teacher bell. What do they do about lunches? That's a very good question. They all brought lunches to school. And they brought them in their lunch cans or their lunch baskets. And the mothers would pack them before they went to school. Sometimes I've, I've read that they might pack a, um, a raw potato in the winter, and the teacher would bake the potatoes <coughs> on the stove. Oh. So the kids would carve their initials in the baked potatoes. And I've read that, I mean, in the, in the raw potato, and by lunchtime they had a baked potato. And I've read that in many, many accounts, that that's how they would get uh, the hot lunch program of the day. <laughs> now, there are a couple of um, frames that, we, that will not come out here. But the, the, this just goes that, to show you that some schools had the ubiquitous piano, too. Many had a pump organ or a piano. And music was a huge part of the daily program. And Nashua appreciated the, um, the music program so much that they actually had a traveling music teacher way back in the 1840s and 50s. They actually appreciated it that much. So they brought their lunches in lunch cans, very much like this, which would really double as a berry pail. And we still find those around on eBay or you know, on, a, in a, on an antique, um, an antique mark. We look for old books, and I do collect old books. They're little, tiny little books, but they're jam-packed with information. No pictures, but lots of words. And I show them to the kids, and they go, oh, because the words are so tiny. And we, we do penmanship with them, Spencerian yeah. script, or Palmer Method, or Reinhardt. Did anyone ever hear get a reward of merit being in school? Yeah. Rewards of merit were little colored cards like the one up on the left. And they used to give them to the children if they did a good recitation or if they got good grades. The teacher would sign her name and say, oh, you get this certificate. So I'm looking for those, too. I'm going to go to the ephemera at the uh, Brimfield Fair. And there's always the clock and the phonograph and the pump, because there was no other place to get water other than the big boys going out with the bucket. And um, they used to drink out of the same dipper, and that is the common story, but it's a true story, because I read it everywhere, that they just took a big swig of water right out of the same dipper until they discovered the effect of germs and they started putting crockery, crockery um, spigot uh, containers in the um, schoolhouses, but the children still used the same dipper. <laughs> until some of them brought their own tin cup and the tin cups would be lined up on the shelf and they knew their cup. And then they had the basin for washing their hands when finally they got the health departments activated to uh, stomp out some of the insidious diseases. The pictures of Abraham Lincoln and uh, Washington are in all the schoolhouses that we can find. The, the uh, central stove and many of the pipes went the entire length of the schoolhouse because the pipe actually helped heat the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Our schoolhouse, is, our, ours has been moved to the back of the schoolhouse just for safety reasons. And we have a much shorter pipe, but believe me, it still does the same job. You've already seen that. But we tell the kids the story of the outhouse. And the Nashua schoolhouse actually had a two-holer. And in the old picture of the schoolhouse, you can see that it had two, two um, entrances. It had two little, this isn't the picture, but it's similar to that one up there that had the woodshed on the end. And the old picture of our schoolhouse actually has a two-holer. And the kids are fascinated because I show them this picture on the bottom 
of what they had to sit on to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and we explain the process, and they go, ooh, well, what happens when it fills up? And then, <laughs> they always ask that question, and then you have to tell them that you dig two new holes. Uh, sorry about the empty frames here, but um, I tried to merge two programs. It wasn't quite successful. But we like to know about their games, and we look for the records. Uh, we look for the records of the children. Now you can see that this girl was absent um, for some of her semesters because she was out with diphtheria, and that was very, very common. She sent us this to show that she was not usually absent, but she was out because there was an epidemic. And uh, Stanley Dolliver is the one that gave me those beautiful paid, uh, pictures from up in Farmington, New Hampshire. Now, this one is a little blurry, but I'm going to take your attention right up to the top of this chart just for a minute. It says District Number One School, and this is a chart from 1842 that I took out of the um, school, the um, city director, uh, not city directories, but the city reports, the annual reports. And if you can see that Miss Bancroft taught in the summertime, and she had oh, 42 scholars, and she taught 17 weeks, and she was paid $9.92 a month. But Mr. Kendall taught in the wintertime, and he had 40 scholars and taught 12 weeks, and he was paid $27 a month. So you can see the value of getting well, these... family to support. Yes, didn't. oh, right, like she didn't, but uh, she, she got paid like roughly one-third the money that the men teachers got. But finally they got smart, as I told you, and they started hiring more women teachers because they came cheap. And that went on for 100 years. Where have the schoolhouses gone? Well, you're probably wondering, does New Hampshire have any left? We do. We have three. Croydon Village in Croydon, New Hampshire. I don't know if you know where that is. I haven't found it yet, but I will. <laughs> Alexandria Village, I haven't visited yet. And the Blue School, I've contacted two or three times, and they never answer me. And I thought that was very rude, because I would like to visit. And it actually is a Blue School. Uh, the Alexandria Village School is still used uh, for the lower grades in Alexandria. There have been threats of closing it as, as much as last year. The Croyd New Croydon School is hanging on by a thread, and the Blue School in Landaff has not updated their website since, six, since uh, 2007, so I'm not sure if they're still operating. But my last um, report was that three schools in, in um, New Hampshire are still operating as public one-room schoolhouses. And you always hear a part of so skinny. Pardon me? Why are the doorways so skinny? I think it's just the, I, th I just think it's a distortion of the picture as it got put into this program. Well, they all, they all seem that way. Well, basically, well, they, ha they did have two doors for the boys and the girls. You probably know that, that they came in two different sides and sat on two separate sides of the room, too. But when we talk about Horace Mann as the um, founder of education, you can see why. Because he lobbied for free public school, teacher training to have better teachers because some of them were just graduates of eighth grade. He, he, was, the, he was the first to, um, uh, not the first, Benjamin Franklin really sort of um, instituted libraries, but he wanted district libraries to be instituted and he wanted state taxes to help pay for education. And so that's why they consider him to be the, the um, father of education. And interestingly enough, the, edu ed the education itself was never even mentioned in the Constitution because they wanted to leave that up to the states to decide how they would educate their children in their state. And they would also decide on the building style and how teachers would be trained and the length of the school year. None of this would ever be determined by the federal government. But they wanted the states to take the lead on that. And But basically... They, literacy in, in English, as I said before, was um, the, uh, the watchword. Children of all ages were taught in one building. We said that. They were constructed from, um, sometimes they were multiple use, where they were the dance hall and the community center and the grange hall and the polling place. They used the cheapest material they could find, local material, and benches could be anything from planks or benches to single or double wooden uh, fold-ups with iron sides. It all depended on how much they were willing to spend. Um, I'll just uh, get you through these so that we can have a, an early night's sleep, too. But all the pictures that you find just show these poor beleaguered teachers uh, with these huge classes and these eager little faces. Uh, playgrounds were 
uh, and sanitary facilities, as we said before, were non-existent in some schoolhouses, and privies were actually, actually a luxury for schoolhouses. Mm -hmm. When you read the early hit schoolhouse history, they actually had to go out in the woods or somewhere where they couldn't um, go behind a tree, and that's the truth. Um, you can see the, the poor position of this schoolhouse. The realities faced by teacher, they were young, they were inexperienced, they were low paid, the condition of the schools was sometimes deplorable. The attendance of the scholars was worse than you could even imagine. We have these idyllic um, ideas of how wonderful it was in a one-room schoolhouse, but attendance could work upwards to 50% every single day. Even when you saw the chart of that teacher in Nashua, she had 40 children enrolled but the average attendance was 24 a day. So it really did go up to 50%. Community <coughs> support was spotty. They were always after the teacher, um, not because of discipline problems, but they always wanted special treatment. What's changed? <laughs> Job security was absolutely nil. If you were a young woman teaching in a school district and the next year one of the school committee people had a niece who needed a job, you were out, she was in. There was absolutely no job security. There was overcrowding, and the living conditions of teachers were deplorable. They usually had, early in the, in the early days, they had to board with the families of the children that they taught. And eventually they added a couple of dollars a month into the budget so that they could rent a room in, the, in somebody's house or in the tavern. Young women, oh, we've already seen this, but uh, the one-room schoolhouse in Nashua you've seen, I would love to have you come and visit the schoolhouse someday. Um, uh, I would make up a time and we could post it somewhere and I will be there in my garb and I would love to have you just visit the schoolhouse and, and, and just take it all in because it's a magnificent place. I tried to merge two programs here and it didn't work but, and I'm almost finished. Early schoolhouses were actually set up like this where the teacher had a little table in the middle and the desks were, were tacked to the wall around the edges. And she kind of took a central role. And the littlest children sat up front on benches that didn't even have backs to them. You can see those poor little kids crying. And this is a Winslow Homer um, picture. Uh, another picture shows pretty much the same thing. The children are towing the line to do their reading while the little scouts are down here falling asleep. <laughs> and the teacher I read, uh, have read liked, liked the little ones to fall asleep so that they could work more with the older ones. <laughs> and there we are. I'm so proud of that school and what Nashua has done to maintain it. I'm so proud of it. And it does face east. Um, for the morning sun, I open those doors and I get the full morning sun. I wonder if someone here in the historic society could set up a date and time. Let us know. I would be glad to do that, and I'll do that with Beth. Uh, and you just tell me whether a morning is good, a morning in the summer is a morning in the summer good. For anybody, you will come. Okay, I will be there. The back of the schoolhouse. It has been meticulously maintained by the husbands of the ladies of the uh, daughters of the king. <laughs> yep, they fix uh, they fix the uh, they fix the hinges and the the cement. Some of these pictures didn't come out because of the uh, merging of two programs. But Is I, that originally brick? It's the original brick. It's the original wainscoting. It's the original flooring. Yeah. They've changed the ceiling. Apparently it had a tin ceiling in it, but it was really um, falling down. So we do a beautiful recreation. Um, sorry about this, but uh, you, you've seen... Oh, these I want you to see because Rudy gave me these pictures. Oh, the Gilboa School didn't come out. Uh, this is the Edgeville School. This is uh, um, one of the early... Uh, you can see the, the different design that they had, but still two doors, one for the boys and one for the girls. And then the country club school, which Why I understand is, is now, uh, pardon me? Why was one for the boys and one for the girls? They did it for better behavior. It was a disciplinary thing to keep the boys separated from the girls. And, and that's, that's where the coat very, racks were as well. The what? There were coat racks on, yes. on both sides. And, and we have a vestibule for each of them. We have a boys' coat closet and a girls' coat closet completely separate. But uh, there are schools now. I understand that Lawrence is trying an experiment now with single-sex classes. I don't know where they're going to get that with the Chapter 9 and all this you know, equality stuff. 
but I think it's a fabulous idea. I think it's a wonderful idea. And they say that already they've seen results with the increase in the boys' academic standing. So the country club school, Rudy told me, is now a house. Is that correct? Thank you. Yeah, it's on, uh, I think it's on 155 uh, Main Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, Edgeville School is on 29 Burke Street. Ah, but it is a home now, right? Yeah. And uh, the Colburn Avenue School, uh, gone? No, uh, it's a home now. Oh. And it's on 20, uh, it's 24 Colburn Avenue. I have my able assistant here. <laughs> Tell me where the schoolhouses have gone. <coughs> and the North Hollis School, gone? Uh -huh. Yeah. But the, it just goes to show you that we did have 11 one-room schoolhouses in this town. And these are the pictures that Rudy scraped up for me, and I was so grateful. But I, the, and the only other things, be, well, we'll be finishing in about five minutes, but I did want to share with you some of the passages that came right out of the city reports written by the superintendent of schools. And I love these. They're very telling. We voluntarily expel, expend liberal sums for the erection and repair of churches and private <coughs> dwellings, but we grumble at a lot.